Allah knows what's best for us So why should we complain? We always want the sunshine But he knows there must be rain We always want the laughter And the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to Inspirations This is a recorded episode of Inspirations and uh, you are invited to write to us on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. We're still talking about the end of the Meccan period where the Prophet ﷺ made hijrah along with Abu Bakr. Now, inshallah, we, we will discuss how the Prophet ﷺ planned to perform hijrah and how he made hijrah. And uh, we will, inshallah, reveal some of the wonderful aspects of the good planning of how to put one's trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to attain success at everything we do. This is a methodology that we can learn from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a, the objective of the whole show is to see the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and try to learn of his wisdom and try to apply this on our lives. So hopefully, inshallah, we will be better Muslims. Inshallah, after we finish with the issue of al-Hijrah, we will stop to, t uh, to take more lessons from the Meccan period. We will briefly just scan the Meccan period and uh, we will take lessons from the major events there, lessons that relate to our present reality. So hopefully we Muslims today can wait, start to wake up and start to uh, take the example of the Prophet wasallam and see our present reality in the light of the Quran and the Sunnah so we have the correct vision instead of wasting our time you know, seeing things based on other people's vision, other people's understanding of life. Because as I said last week that most people, unfortunately, they have adopted the Western way, the materialistic way of life, even of thinking itself. So they only uh, evaluate and they only uh, measure things according to the material standards. And this is a severe problem and it has brought us a lot of humiliation and a lot of indignation <coughs> at this uh, day and age in which we live. So this is why it's important for us to see the life of, of the Muhammad وسلم, as a role model for us. So we learn from it, every event. And for, uh, it's part of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the life of Muhammad وسلم, so fertile in events and uh, so uh, you know, there are plentiful or plenty of different situations that we can uh, le learn from. Variant types of situations of uh, scales of power, you know, different uh, things the Prophet ﷺ had to go through so that we w it's a rich source of behavior that we learn how to follow it regardless of what our situation is. Now the Prophet ﷺ was commanded after the Muslims started to make hijrah. We said that Umar al-Khattab made hijrah. We said that uh, Umm Salama made hijrah and how it was a real disaster when uh, her family refused that she goes with her husband to Medina. So her husband had to leave by himself. The family of his husband took her son because they didn't want to leave their son with her. And she remained for one year in Mecca suffering and weeping all, every day until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought her a way out of this calamity. She took her son. She was given permission to go to Medina. She joined her husband in Medina. Uh, then uh, Umar ibn Khattab started making hijrah. He made hijrah and we, I believe we talked about how he made hijrah. And I have to point out that the uh, narrations that suggest that Umar ibn Khattab went in Mecca, to the middle of Mecca, and he said, anyone who wants his mother to lose him, let him follow me. I'm going to Medina. I'm making hijrah to Medina. Now, this uh, uh, narration is not authentic at all. So we can't depend on it. On the contrary, the uh, authentic narration suggests that Umar al-Khattab discreetly made hijrah to Medina. He didn't 
do that publicly because it was a real hazard and real danger. So he made that with Ayash, and the person called Ayash ibn Rabi'ah. They made uh, Hijra to Medina together. There was another one, who, third one who was supposed to join them, but he didn't come. He migrated later on. Uh, so uh, it was time for the Prophet ﷺ to make Hijra. Most of the Muslims made Hijra already. The Prophet ﷺ was there. Now Quraysh expected that the followers of Muhammad, most of them are in Medina already. So it shows this is an indication that Muhammad will follow them. He will catch up with them. And if he does so, then obviously he's going to build a state. He's going to uh, start a new state there in Medina, get more supporters, more followers. And then obviously he will come back to Mecca as a conqueror, as a person who will come and open Mecca and overtake it. So they said, we have to destroy this from the root. We have to get rid of Muhammad now at the moment, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet ﷺ, so it was a very, very critical moment. The air was tense in Mecca. The people in Mecca gathered in what they called Dar al Nadwa as their parliament at that time. They gathered there, many of them. Some narrations suggest that a shaitan came in the form of a man. Satan himself, Iblis, came in the form of a man, Bedouin man coming from Najd, who joined them and he said, You know, I'm from Najd and I would like to take part you know, with you in uh, finding a solution to this problem. But this narration, the scholars of hadith have differed regarding it. Some scholars of hadith consider it to be weak. Some of them consider it to be, to raise up to the level of Hassan. This is why I will not mention it because of the difference, difference of the scholars. And it doesn't really add to the issue of this era. But what we know and what has been, you know, established authentically that the disbelievers, the people of Mecca gathered in Darun Nadwa, all of them together, and the main theme of this gathering was to come up with a solution to the dilemma of Muhammad. Muhammad obviously will follow his, or will catch up with his followers in Medina. And this is a real danger. We have to get rid of him. What can we do with him? Now someone said, well, what we do, we put him in prison, we put him in jail. Okay, we keep him there until he dies like the people who came before him, then he dies. And this is how we get rid of his problem and we don't have to deal with the consequences of that. Someone said, this is not a good opinion. And as I said, the weak narrations suggest that this was shaitan. But as I said, we can't establish this authentically. There's a bit of difference of opinion. This is why I will not depend on this narration. Someone said, this is not a good solution because <clears throat> If you put him there, now his followers are already in Medina, more of them will, be, uh, will join them as well there in Medina. Then they will you know, set up an army, they will, can make themselves, organize themselves in the form of an army and come to you and get him out of his jail and he will gain more power. So this is not a good solution. Somebody said, okay, let's you know, expel him out of Mecca, send him to exile, let him go whatever, wherever he wants to go. Someone said, this is not a good opinion because if you expel him, and this is actually what he wants, to go out of Mecca, okay? He will be joined by his followers, he will set up a new state, a new army, then obviously he's going to come to take revenge because we persecuted him and his companions. So he's going to come to us with a, with a huge army. So we, that's not a good solution. Now Abu Jahl ibn Hisham came with one opinion. He said, you know, I have a solution that none of you has thought of. It's the first time that I present the solution. I, be, I believe we should bring from every clan among the tribe of Quraysh, bring from every clan a young man, a very strong young man who's among the elite of this clan, about eight to 10 people, bring them all together, give them swords, and all of them kill Muhammad at once, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Kill him at once. Now what's the wisdom behind you know, getting eight to 10 people from among the eight or ten clans of Quraysh to kill Muhammad all at one time. Because they feared the issue of revenge. If someone was to kill the Prophet wasallam, now his clan, the children of Abdul Muttalib would take revenge. So that would be a war among the people of, among two clans in Mecca. But with this solution, this devil, devilish solution that came from Abu Jahl, it suggests that all of the clans gather together. So when the people of Abdul Muttal, the children of Abdul Muttal want to take revenge, they can't find, fight all the people of Mecca. So they have to accept, just take the blood money 
of uh, a person being killed and that's it. So Abu Jahl said to them, this is the solution that I come up with. Get young men among the elite of every clan, strong men, give them swords and all of them at once kill Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is how his blood is, you know, distributed among all the clans. So nobody can take revenge and the people of our children of Abdul Muttalib will have no other option but to accept the blood money of Muhammad and that's it. We get rid of him for good. This was the conclusion all of them agreed on and this is what they decided to do. Now at that time, uh, some of the narrations call this to be the day of Zahma, the day of uh, rush hour. Because at that time, Mecca was, you know, uh, boiling with uh, a lot of emotions and a lot of negative emotions towards Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and a lot of planning and uh, preparations for this crime. Whereas on the other side, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because Abu Bakr went, had... Uh, the intention to make or had had the intention to make hijrah but the Prophet ﷺ said to him stay here stay here I'm waiting for the perm for permission from Allah to make hijrah so he was alluding to Abu Bakr that we will go together we will be companions in this hijrah so Abu, Abu Bakr was waiting for that now the Prophet ﷺ during that time after you know the people of Mecca were going around Mecca seeing the houses of the Muslims empty deserted homes Nothing, the doors are open, the windows are open, and, you know, and there's nothing there. Some of the furniture is left because most of the, of the migrants, most of the Muslim muhajireen, they couldn't carry everything, they carried what they could carry and they left the furniture, some of their businesses, some of their goods, some of the things they had, some of their properties, they had to leave them, they couldn't take, them, take all of that with them. So they lost a great deal, the hijrah wasn't an easy thing, some people think, oh it was a way out. Yes it was a way out, but it was very difficult, this is why some Muslims didn't make hijrah, they couldn't. Because it meant you had sometimes to leave your family, you had to leave your property, the thing that you worked hard to buy or to get, you had to leave it, you had no other option. Or you had to leave some of your furniture, some of the valuable things you had, you couldn't carry them, you had to leave them. So it was very difficult for them to move from them home, their homeland, leave their tribe, leave their people, their cousins, their family, their clan, leave all of that and go to Medina to a new state or to a new city and among strangers. But it was time for sacrifice. So they did sacrifice. Now the Prophet ﷺ during that time, which was very tense, as I said, in Mecca. He would go to Abu Bakr in the morning once and in the evening once. They would spend some time together, obviously, studying Quran, uh, learning more about Islam. The Prophet ﷺ would teach Abu Bakr and maybe other Muslims about uh, the Quran, planning maybe for Hijrah or anything. One day, when it was midday, and it was an extremely hot day, and that time in Mecca, no one would dare go out in the streets because it was you know, burning wind, the wind was scorching, no one could go out. At that time the Prophet ﷺ went out of his house and he covered his face and he went to the house of Abu Bakr. He knocked on the door, they said to Abu Bakr, it's your friend Muhammad. He said, as he has come now at this time, it must be something really urgent, something very important. He rushed to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, please come in, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, oh, tell your family, meaning your wife and your children, your daughters, to just leave this room and go inside so I can come in. He said, O Messenger of, of Allah, that's your family, it's Aisha. Aisha, she's, she's, oh, she's been engaged to the Prophet ﷺ already. You know, the, she has become his, uh, on record, she has become his wife. So the Prophet ﷺ went in and he said, Ya Abu Bakr, I've been given the permission to make hijrah. Abu Bakr was waiting for that moment. He said, Oh Messenger of Allah, as Sahaba, companionship, let me be your companion in this journey. He was waiting for that moment. Such a privilege to be with the Messenger ﷺ, to protect him, to be able to take care of the Prophet ﷺ in such a noble act, such an important event in the life of Muhammad ﷺ. Abu Bakr wanted to be with him, helping him, supporting him, taking care of him, providing him, you know, even, you know, sacrificing his money for his own sake. So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay. Abu Bakr said, oh Messenger of Allah, I've prepared two camels that we can, you know, uh, take or we can ride on to get to Medina. The pro so you take one and I will take one. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, but I will pay for it. I will pay for it. This shows us that the Prophet ﷺ, even having Abu Bakr, a very wealthy man, putting all his money for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't mean that we take everything he has. 
Now, what we see today, and I, I really like, I would like to bring this to attention. Sometimes some rich people, some of the rich people among the Muslims, mashallah, they are very generous and they give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people who work for charities, some people who work in, uh, uh, as a, on a vo voluntary basis to provide for the poor, the orphans, and so on and so forth, they approach such rich people, but sometimes they exploit them. Or they really go overboard with asking them for money. We have to show respect and we have to be moderate. When we, if someone is very good, is very generous for the sake of Allah, we have to be moderate. And we have to pay from our own selves. The Prophet وسلم, although being the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah وسلم, such a great position, such a great station, and his sins are forgiven past and present and future. But he wants to pay for it. Why? Because he wants more reward. He wants to sacrifice. He doesn't want the people to take all the burden. He wants to share that burden. He wants, he wants to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants to do more actions to Allah. Anything he could, he wanted to do it. And this is how we should be today. That even if you feel that you are doing good, if you can do something, you know, your main concern should be how I can please Allah more, how I can do something, how, how I can sacrifice. This is the sweetest thing in this life, to be able to sacrifice for the sake of Allah. Oh Allah, I will sacrifice. Any option, any opportunity you have to sacrifice for the sake of Allah, you rush to do it and you do it happily, full-heartedly. This is how we should be and this is how the Prophet ﷺ was. Now, uh, just as we are talking about the rich Muslims, unfortunately, the rich Muslims don't trust many people who work in the field of charity and voluntary work. And this is a problem that we have to address. Because many people have proven not to be reliable in terms of how they spend the money that they get from the rich people. But here is a message to our rich Muslims because we have plenty of wealthy Muslims, mashallah, and some of them build hotels for cats to accommodate cats. Some of them build, you know, uh, some of them pay millions of money for some really stupid things. While Muslims are being killed, some Muslims die of starve, starve to death, some Muslims don't have even clothes to cover their bodies, and so, some Muslims are really wasting their money in silly and ridiculous things. A message that I would really send uh, forth to our rich uh, Muslim brothers and sisters that direct your money to the things that will bring the Muslims back to Islam, and things that will bring the Muslims back to the, their high station that Allah wanted them to be in. For example, support students of knowledge who will become scholars. Now many of the students of knowledge, the ones I'm personally aware of, many of them have to sacrifice much of their time just to make a living. Why don't we support, ded, let them dedicate their time fully to seek knowledge and to uh, you know, uh, show and uh, unreveal the, the, or to reveal the beauties of Al Islam and the, the wisdoms in Al Islam and to spread Islam around the world. Let's free them to, for this. Let's just help them dedicate their time totally and fully for that, such, for such a noble action, such a noble mission. Why don't we do that? Why don't you put your money in this field? Why don't you put your money in the field of getting back the manuscripts, the great heritage the Muslim scholars have left for us, which have been taken, stolen, by many people in the West and they put them and they preserve them in, uh, uh, in museums, put them there and then we have to pay to get our own manuscripts. Yes, they have, we have to admit that they made such a tremendous effort in preserving our manuscripts because we were not aware of this, because we were busy with this life but they realized how valuable the manuscripts are. Let's direct our money to things like that, things that will bring the Muslims back to their, uh, to their owner and to their religion and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Abu Bakr, I will pay for the camel. They agreed. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appointed a time for Abu Bakr to join him, to come to him. And it seems that it was uh, at night. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went back home. At that day, at that very day, Mecca or the people of Mecca were determined to kill Muhammad. On that very day, or on the following morning, on the next morning, the Prophet ﷺ went home, Allah informed him of the plan of Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ said to Ali, asked Ali to stay in his bed, 
pretending that he was the Prophet. So the people of Quraysh would think he was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ali, who was a young man, he put his life for the sake of Islam. You see the bravery that those Muslims had? You see what's the solution to our problems today? There is no honor and there is no victory for Islam without grasping the realities of Al-Iman. Without, uh, without knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names and attributes. Without loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the extent that nothing really competes with Allah. There's no rival. Allah has no rival in our hearts. This is how, how things should be. Then people will be ready to put their lives, to put their wealth. Then people will be strong. They will go to a higher level of strength and energy and determination to bring victory to Islam. And this is how we should deal with the problems in which and the uh, humiliation in which the Muslims live today. This is how we should deal with it. But the people who are attached to this life, the people who, uh, all what they worry about is how to satisfy their needs, how to satisfy, you know, what they like, the food. They're always fussy about the kind of food they want to eat, about the kind of perfume they're going to wear, about the kind of TV shows they're going to watch, about what kind of uh, furniture they would like to have, what kind of colors. They're very sensitive to that. Well, their the Muslim brothers and sisters are being killed and murdered in such, an, uh, such an, uh, an evil and heinous way. The irony is unbelievable when we see the situation of the Muslims. Some people are very fussy about, you know, small things, about uh, l what kind of shoes they wear, what kind of trainers, you know, okay, they're wearing, what kind of tracksuits, what ki kind of uh, uh, clothes they're wearing. They're very sensitive about the colors, about the match of the different levels of certain colors. It's unbelievable. People are being killed. You are not created for that. You're created for something very noble. Something much higher than all of these things that you keep yourself busy with. So, people who are attached to this world and to these you know, small and tiny things and details about this life and they are very fussy about it and if they don't get what they want their life is destroyed their uh, you know their persona is is shattered this is unbelievable muslims are not like that muslims are strong muslims are powerful they have determination they have an unwavering faith why because their hearts are attached to allah they know what this life is all about and they give it what it really deserves, they give it the weight it deserves. They don't, you know, bring it higher than what it de they don't give it more weight than it, it truly deserves. So this is the way they put their lives for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ali ibn Abi Talib slept in the bed of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left. Some of the narrations suggest that those young men, about 10 people, with their swords ready, because they were viewing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, view some holes or the window of his house, that he was still sleeping. So the Messenger of Allah went out of his house, walked among them, and they couldn't see him. Some of the narrations suggest, that, uh, suggest this event to have happened. Uh, they seem to be sound. So the Prophet of Allah left his house and left Ali ibn Abi Talib there, uh, being shrouded and covered with his, uh, the green garment or the green cloak of the Messenger of Allah, which he used to sleep or cover himself with when he, sl when he slept. So every time they looked into the house of the Prophet Sallallahu they thought, oh, he's still sleeping. He's still sleeping. In the morning, he will wake up and we will get him. Once he wakes up, that's it, death. Abu Bakr came to the house of the Prophet Sallallahu He found someone shrouded in bed. He thought it was the messenger because well, there was an appointment. They agreed on that time. So he came to him and he said, oh, messenger of Allah, Ali ibn Abi said to him, the Prophet Sallallahu had already left. And he is near the well of Bi'r Maymun, the well of Maymun. Okay, go and catch up with him there. It was just before Fajr time. So Abu Bakr went and he joined the Prophet ﷺ there. And the people of Quraysh were still thinking that, that the, the person in bed was Muhammad ﷺ. So they were waiting for the moment to jump on him and kill him. Abu Bakr joined the Prophet ﷺ. They set out. Imagine, Medina is to the north. They... Uh, headed south and that was a very intelligent thing from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam such a beautiful and wonderful and intelligent plan a person is going to Medina is obviously going to go to head to the north so he knew 
that the people of Mecca will be or would be chasing him northward. So he went to the south. That was such a wonderful plan. They went to a cave where the Prophet ﷺ, which, or which the Prophet ﷺ appointed to stay there. And they went to that cave. Uh, the people of Mecca were waiting, or the, these young men were waiting outside the house of the Prophet ﷺ. They used to throw some stones because they wanted the Prophet ﷺ to wake up. So once he wake up, they kill him. Uh, then Ali ibn Abi Talib woke up. They came into the house. Was Ali ibn Abi Talib? They said, where is Muhammad? He said, I don't know. So they realized that they were uh, set up and the, the Prophet ﷺ was, you know, many steps ahead of them and he was more intelligent than them. He could foresee what they were planning because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told him. So Mecca now was in rage. All of them were going around seeking news about Muhammad ﷺ. Where did he go? Where did, go and find him, get and find him. They actually appointed a prize of a hundred camels and 100 camels at that time was such a huge amount of wealth it's just like saying let's say about half a million today half a million dollars today was almost something like that according to our terms today or according to our calculations so anyone who gets muhammad alive or dead he will get a thousand or a hundred camels or his friend abu Bakr. go and get them everyone chase them so everybody in Mecca was going around like headless chicken, you know, ch seeking the Prophet Sallallahu trying to get news about him. Where did he go? What did he find? You know, following any traces, trying to see, what, get, you know, sniffing for news. They couldn't get to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi had already headed with Abu Bakr. Now we will see what happened with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr. And did the believers get to catch up with them? This is something, inshallah, we will find out after the short break. So stay tuned. Is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Al Khalaq is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran in Surah Hijr, Surah number 15, ayat number 86. Al Khalaq is the superlative of Khalaq. He is the master creator. Don't you see how we have created the camels? Allah used specially the camel. Why? Because there are so many scientific facts. This animal is unique. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting us. Al Khalaq is the one who created the camel. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said Allah has 99 names. 100 minus 1. Whoever comprehends them will have Jannah. The supreme name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah. Allah is the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We talked about Al-Ahad, its meaning and its implication upon us. We talked about Al-A'la, Al-Akram, Al-Awwal, Al-Akhir, Al-Zahir, Al-Batin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided everything on the face of the earth for us to do good in order to do good we need to first recognize the one who is the source of all goodness and that is al -Bar. it is just Allah's way to make Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. And as I said previously, you are all invited to join us by writing to us on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. Again, it's inspirations at huda.tv. Your comments are valuable. And as I always say that, they really add to the show a lot. And they open my eyes to some of the things that are missing in the show and to some of the things that we can improve in the show. So may Allah reward all of you. And you know that the first Saturday of every month, inshallah, most of the time, we will have a live episode. So you can call in and you can join us. So inshallah, in an attempt to maximize our benefit and uh, our knowledge from the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We said that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa headed to uh, southward towards the cave in top of one of the mountains. 
uh, with Abu Bakr and the people of Mecca were in a state of rage. They wanted actually to ask the wind about Muhammad. They wanted to ask the, uh, the sand, everything, anyone who can get news about Muhammad. Because they realized that if he gets out of Mecca, if he, get, if he gets away from them, then it's going to be a disaster for them. That he will make a huge force and he will come and overtake Mecca from them. They realized that. So they said, we have to get rid of him. So this is why they, they did everything they could to get Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went with Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr sometimes was walking in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sometimes behind him, sometimes to the right, to the left. And he was very worried and apprehensive. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw him and he said, Abu Bakr, you know, you know, what's wrong with you? What are, why are you behaving this way? You're very nervous. You, sometimes you walk ahead of me, sometimes you walk behind me, sometimes to the right, to the left. You know, what's, you know, what's up? He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you know, every t when I walk, in front of you, I fear that they will catch up with us from behind. So I say, no, I have to be behind you. So if anything happens, you know, I get shot, for example, or I can defend you. And when I come behind you, I'm, I, I, th I think they might come, in, you know, from the front, they might come from the right, the left. So I don't know every time I move to one side because I don't want them to get to you. I want to be there first and I want to defend you. So this is how much love he had for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was ready to put his life. He wanted, you know, he, he wanted to put his life and save the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even from a thorn, any pain. He didn't want the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to suffer anything. And even if it meant for Abu Bakr to sacrifice his own life. And this is the love that we should have for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Especially at a time when we have seen, you know, over the last few years, people from uh, the Western countries are always attacking the Messenger وسلم, trying to ridicule him in different forms and different fashions but we say the way to defend the Prophet وسلم, the correct way is that you practice his sunnah, follow his example it's, you know, it's unbelievable to see some naked women, half naked women going out and she's, you know, a woman is writing on her chest okay, when she's really wearing nasty clothes and she's writing we love you O Messenger of Allah, where is the love? Where is the love in your own looks? Where is the hijab? That's not love. That's emotion. That's emotion. It's like many, you know, or a considerable number of Muslims they have when Muslims undergo a massacre or a disaster. You know, they become very outraged. And they, the last thing they think is changing themselves. They don't want to do that. They say we're ready for jihad. We will do this and we will do that. Okay, just give up riba. No, they can't do it. Give up, you know, f music. No, they can't do that. If you can't defeat the enemy within, you will not be able to defeat your enemy at all. You will not be able to stand in the faces at all. And this is a fact the Prophet ﷺ understood perfectly and he taught his companions perfectly. This is why at Mecca, he was working on their aqidah and this is something that we will talk about inshallah because this is one of the most important lessons that we can take from the Meccan period. So the Prophet uh, really, he said to Abu Bakr, you love me to that extent, he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you know, there's nobody that I love as I love you, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But anyway, they went and they reached the cave. Now the, Abu Bakr said to the Prophet hold on, stick there, don't go in the cave. He went first and he checked the cave. Because he was, he, you know, there might be some, you know, insect, some scorpions or something, anything, or snakes or anything that might harm the Prophet ﷺ. He said, no, let me go in and if there is anything, I will be hit and you will be protected. To that extent, the love that they had was, yes. This is why when they had real love, they followed the example of Muhammad ﷺ. When Abu Bakr became the Khalifa, he said, there is nothing from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ I will do away with. I will preserve it all, no matter what it takes, I will preserve it. This is the true love. So if we really have love, let's follow, follow the example of Muhammad ﷺ, even in, in the tiniest details that we have. Don't call anything of Islam superficial or insignificant. You don't know what Allah knows. When Allah instructs us to do something in the Quran or through the Prophet ﷺ in the Sunnah, it means it is important for us. It means Allah is pleased with it. That's enough for us to do it. That's enough for us. Don't say, oh, this is not important. The Muslims are being killed and we're talking about the Sunnah. We're talking about, you know, these things. You don't know, maybe the Muslims are being killed because we, we are falling short in 
obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the reality. So let's wake up. Let's really measure things using the measure in the Quran and the Sunnah rather than the materialistic measure which is totally faulty and incorrect. And it reveals disbelief or weakness of belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abu Bakr went into the cave. He checked it. There was nothing. He said, O Messenger of Allah, now you can come in. The Prophet ﷺ went into the cave and Abu Bakr joined him. Now this great man Abu Bakr, let's see you know, what kind of daughters he had. Uh, at, at home he had Asma and Aisha. May Allah be pleased with them. Now the father of Abu Bakr, Abdullah ibn Abi Quhatha, he came to the house of Abu Bakr. He was, at that time, he wasn't a Muslim. He came, and he's, he came to his grand daughters, Aisha, because he was the father of Abu Bakr. He came to them and he said, Oh, he took all his money and he left you without any money, this, this man? But actually, Abu Bakr took all his money. Yes, he took 5,000 dirhams. And some narrations suggest 6,000 dirhams. That was all his wealth, all his uh, cash money that he had. He took it all. So Asma being a believer Muslim, she was, she, who was raised in the house of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, she said, oh no, gra no grandfather, he left us plenty of money. Then she went to the place where Abu Bakr used to put his money and she put some pebbles and she covered them with a piece of cloth. So they, the feeling of them was like, the feel of them was like money, was like some co like coins. So uh, he came and she took his hand because he was a blind man. She said to him, okay, you can feel here. He felt it, he felt the piece of cloth. She said, he left us plenty of money. He said, oh, okay, if he left you some money, uh, he if he left you enough money, that's fine. That's, my, that's fine, then well done. He did a very great job. Now Mecca was running around. They wanted uh, the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr. They sent everybody and they spread the news around the Arabs. Anyone who gets Muhammad, he will get a hundred camels, just get him. They wanted to get him, they would pay any price to get Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to the cave and actually one group of the disbelievers really managed to get to that cave. They reached actually that cave. They were only maybe, what, three feet away from the cave, or three or two feet away from the cave, less than one meter. They came to the cave because they were chasing some traces or some footsteps and they got to that mountain and they got to the cave and Abu Bakr started shivering. He was taken by fear. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, if anyone looks at his feet, they were standing. He said, if anyone looks at his own feet, he would see us. This is how close they got. And I want you to imagine yourself being just in a, for example, in a, one of those you know, cosmopolitan cities, being chased by some gangsters, criminals. They want to take, take your money, they wanted to kill you. They were chasing you in the alleyways and you managed to get, and then you hide in one corner and they get that close to you, less than one meter away from you. And they are about to catch you and you can, you can hear them speaking. And imagine the fear, that, because if they catch you, it means death. Maybe, I, I believe that, maybe they will get you because uh, the only thing that will expose you and tell them about you will be your heartbeats. Your heart will be beating so loud that they would hear that out of fear. So Abu Bakr was scared, oh Messenger of Allah. If he was whispering to the Prophet ﷺ, if any of them looks at his feet, he would see us. This is how close they got. Because he, th he thought about death, that's it, that's the end. Not death about himself because he was ready to sacrifice his life. But he was concerned about the Prophet ﷺ. Because he loved him more than he loved himself. And he knew that the Prophet ﷺ meant light and salvation for humanity. The Prophet ﷺ, having all this faith and belief in Allah, he said, with all calmness and all, tra all tranquility and all confidence, he said, Ya Abu Bakr, ma dhannuka bithnayni Allahu thalithuhuma? Ya Abu Bakr, what do, you do? what do you think about two people? Allah is the third of them. Allah is with us. Don't fear. We have did what we could, we planned very well, and we did everything we could do, and then Allah will protect. Allah is with us. If the whole world is against you, if Allah is with you, it doesn't make any difference. You don't fear anybody. And this is what we say today to the Muslims. You know, you say we have to prepare an army and get... Even if you prepare an army, the Prophet ﷺ said about the Muslims, he said that the people, all the nations will gather together, will, will call themselves 
to attack you, to jump on you, as the people call themselves to eat from a plate of food or a platter of food. As food people invite each other, come and eat, come and join us, have some food. People will join, so you will be like a plate of food. People will jump, you will be helpless like food. People will come to eat, will eat, will eat you, will jump on you, will kill you, will destroy you. So the companion said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, will, 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 be, will that be because we will be very little in number because they will outnumber us? He said, no, you will be great in number. You will be huge, a huge number. What? One billion? Two hundred million? At, at least, the least estimation. The maximum is one and a half billion people, Muslims, in this world. One out of every, even more, it's the percentage is even more than one. One out of five is a Muslim in this world. And in some narrations, some narrations say, authentic narrations say that, no, you will outnumber your enemies, but you will be ghutha, you will be like this scum. You know, this scum, the dirty things, the foam that floats on the sea, that floats on, the, on a river, it's just dirty things, small tiny particles uh, and foam, this is what you will be insignificant having no control the tide will take you right and left and this is what is the case of the Muslims today we're insignificant we don't have any influence on the world on the contrary the whole world is imposing things on us and we are taking taking them we have no choice we go with we, we flow with the current if they come up with a new fashion all of a sudden you find all the Muslim youth are doing it all this funky hairstyle strange things and you know uh, hanging trousers hanging below the backside are despicable things the Muslims are doing it have some kind of new hairstyle uh, you know all these funky and stupid hairstyles they're coming up with stupid things like sleep look and high and narrow and all that stuff it comes up within a few days you see the Muslim youth are having it new fashion you find it among the Muslim youth among the Muslim girls, and I'm saying, I'm talking about the males and the females, everybody. So we're helpless. We just, you know, they take us wherever they want. Because they speak English and French, we start speaking English and French, and we don't want to speak Arabic. We're happy about that. It's unbelievable. So the Prophet ﷺ said, he's directing us to the reality, as if, Wallahi, as if the Prophet ﷺ was describing our present reality today. You will outnumber your enemies. You will be so great in number, but you will be with that scum, nothing. Nothing insignificant. Dust. This is what you will be. Ghutha unka ghutha is sail. Like a you know, flowing water, a river, or a stream that's carrying some dirt and some small particles, tiny particles and form. This is what you are. It's nothing. Nakinakum ghutha unka ghutha is sail. Then the Prophet says, uh, Allah will take from the hearts of your enemies any respect and any fear for you. And now who respects the Muslims today? The Muslims were killed, and tortured and destroyed and oppressed in such a way. You know, all of you make protests all around the world, okay Muslims? Make all protests, you know, make objections to the UN, to all the embassies around the in all Muslim capitals, okay? Do whatever you want. Who cares? You're nothing. You have no respect and nobody fears you, O oh Muslims. Why? Because you are away from Allah. Because the Prophet ﷺ will explain in the, in the next sentence. No one has any respect, no one has any fear of you, O oh Muslims. You are nothing. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, and this is exactly, by the way, this is what we are, what we are today. Then he says, وَلَا يَقْذِفَنَّ اللَّهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمُ الْوَهْنِ And Allah will place in your hearts wahn. The companion said, oh, what's wahn, O Messenger of Allah? Wahn means weakness. What's wahn, O Messenger of Allah? And this is the secret of all the problems. Wallahi, if we get to deal with this problem, there will be no massacres in Gaza, there will be no massacres anywhere. On the contrary, the Muslims will overcome their enemies and there will be peace and security in the whole world. This is what will happen, but we don't want to. The Prophet ﷺ said, and Allah will place in your hearts al-wahan. The companions said, oh Messenger of Allah, what's the one? It's something scary, the whole description is scary. The companions did, didn't want to be in a situation in which we are today. So they said, oh, oh Messenger of Allah, what's one? What is it? What's this weakness? 
He said, love of this world. Love of this world and hatred of death. You will hate, you will fear to die and you will love this world. You will hold on to it. You will cling to it. You will do everything to get wealth, to get status, to get uh, good clothes, to get a good car, to get a good house, to get reputation, to get good food. To get, that's it. The trivial things of this world. You will be attached to that. You will love this life. You don't want to live. You are not ready to put your life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if some people claim that we will put our lives for jihad, it's just lip service. When the moment really comes, they will not be able because Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An-Nisa, Alam tara ila ladina qila lahum kuffu aydiyakum wa aqimu salata wa atu zakah. Haven't you seen, haven't you seen the people to whom we said, okay, hold your hands back? Because they came to the Prophet ﷺ after Hijrah. They said, O Messenger of Allah, we were expelled out of, out of our land. We have to go to those people and kill them and take their money. The Prophet ﷺ said, it's not time for us to wage war yet. I'm not giving permission. So Allah is saying, didn't you see them? We said to them, hold your hands back. It's not time to fight now because you are not ready. You don't have enough Iman to fight. You're not ready for that. And this is what we say to all Muslims, let's work on our Iman. We need to work on our faith. We need to work on our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, Allah is saying, didn't you see to those people who said to them, hold back your hands, okay, and establish the prayer. And give zakah. Because the prayer increases your Iman. It's not something insignificant. Some people say, you're talking about prayer and the Muslims are being killed. The prayer is the, is the thing that is going to save your brothers and sisters. But we don't realize because we don't measure things by the standards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So when the time, Allah says, when the time for real fight has come, when time for real fight has come, you know, they feared the people more than they feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we say, now if we want really to, uh, victory to Islam, for Islam, we have to follow the example of the Prophet sallallahu and be like those companions of the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who were ready to put their lives for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the, the mushrikeen were just on top of the cave where the Prophet sallallahu and Abu Bakr were hiding. What happened after that? And what was the case of the people of Quraysh? And how did the Prophet sallallahu respond to that? And how did, did he get himself and Abu Bakr out of this? This is something we'll find out insha'Allah next week. So you are invited to join us. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. what's best for us. So why should we complain? We always want the sunshine. But he knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter. And the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirit and the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make spirits wrong see the life of, of the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as a role model for us so we learn from it every event and for, uh, it's part of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the life of Muhammad وسلم, so fertile in events and uh, so, uh, you know, there are plentiful or plenty of different situations that we can uh, le learn from. Variant types of situations of uh, scales of power, you know, different uh, 
things the Prophet ﷺ had to go through so that we, it's a rich source of behavior that we learn how to follow it regardless of what our situation is. Now the Prophet ﷺ was commanded after the Muslims started to make hijrah. We said that Umar al-Khattab made hijrah. We said that uh, Umm Salama made hijrah and how it was a real disaster when uh, her family refused that she goes with her husband to Medina, so her husband had to leave by himself. The family of his husband took her son because they didn't want to leave their son with her. And she remained for one year in Mecca, suffering and weeping all, every day until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought her a way out of this calamity. She took her son, she was given permission to go to Medina. She joined her husband in Medina. Uh, then uh, Umar al Khattab started making hijrah. He made hijrah and we, I believe we talked about how he made hijrah and I have to point out that the uh, narrations that suggest that Umar ibn Khattab Allah knows what's best for us So why should we complain? We always want the sunshine but he knows there must be rain we always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer but our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear so whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to Inspirations This is a recorded episode of Inspirations And uh, you are invited to write to us On our email address Inspirations at huda.tv We're still talking about the end of the Meccan period where the Prophet ﷺ made hijrah along with Abu Bakr. Now, inshallah, we, we will discuss how the Prophet ﷺ planned to perform hijrah and how he made hijrah. And uh, we will, inshallah, reveal some of the wonderful aspects of the good planning, of how to put one's trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how to attain success at everything we do. This is a methodology that we can learn from the Prophet Wasallam, and this is a, the objective of the whole show is to see the life of Muhammad Wasallam and try to learn of his wisdom and try to apply this on our lives so hopefully inshallah we will be better Muslims. Inshallah after we finish with the issue of Al-Hijrah we will stop to, t uh, to take more lessons from the Meccan period. We will briefly just scan the Meccan period and uh, we will take lessons from the major events there lessons that relate to our present reality so hopefully we Muslims today can wait, start to wake up and start to uh, take the example of the Prophet وسلم, and see our present reality in the light of the Quran and the Sunnah so we have the correct vision instead of wasting our time you know seeing things based on other people's vision, other people's understanding of life because as I said last week that most people unfortunately they have adopted the western way, the materialistic way of life, even of thinking itself so they only uh, evaluate and they only uh, measure things according to the material standards and this is a severe problem and it has brought us a lot of humiliation and a lot of indignation <coughs> at this uh, day and age in which we live. So this is why it's important for us to went in Mecca to the middle of Mecca and he said anyone who wants his mother to lose him let him follow me I'm going to Medina I'm making Hijrah to Medina. Now this uh, uh, narration is not authentic at all so we can't depend on it. On the contrary the uh, authentic narration suggests that Umar al-Khattab discreetly made Hijrah to Medina. He didn't do that publicly because it was a real hazard and real danger. So he made that with Ayash and the person called Ayash ibn Rabi'ah. They made uh, Hijrah to Medina together. There was another one, who, third one who was supposed to join them but he didn't come. He migrated later on. Uh, so 
it was time for the Prophet ﷺ to make hijrah. Most of the Muslims made hijrah already. The Prophet ﷺ was there. Now Quraysh expected that the followers of Muhammad, most of them are in Medina already. So it shows this is an indication that Muhammad will follow them. He will catch up with them. And if he does so, then obviously he's going to build a state. He's going to uh, start a new state there in Medina, get more supporters, more followers. And then obviously he will come back to Mecca as a conqueror, as a person who will come and open Mecca and overtake it. So they said, we have to destroy this from the root. We have to get rid of Muhammad now at the moment, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so it was a very, very critical moment. The air was tense in Mecca. The people in Mecca gathered in what they called Dar al Nadwa as their parliament at that time. They gathered there, many of them, some narrations suggest that a shaitan came in the form of a man. Satan himself, Iblis, came in the form of a man, Bedouin man, coming from Najd, who joined them and he said, you know, I'm from Najd and I would like to take part, you know, with you in uh, finding a solution to this problem. But this narration, the scholars of hadith have differed regarding it. Some scholars of hadith consider it to be weak. Some of them consider it to be, to raise up, to the level of Hassan. This is why I will not mention it because of the difference, difference of the scholars and it doesn't really add to the issue of this era. But what we know and what has been you know, established authentically that the disbelievers, the people of Mecca gathered in Darun Nadwa, all of them together. And the main theme of this gathering was to come up with a solution to the dilemma of Muhammad. Muhammad obviously will follow his I will catch up with his followers in Medina, and this is a real danger. We have to get rid of him. What can we do with him? Now, someone said, well, what we do, we put him in prison, we put him in jail. Okay, we keep him there until he dies, like the people who came before him. Then he dies, and this is how we get rid of his problem, and we don't have to deal with the consequences of that. Someone said, this is not a good opinion. And as I said, the weak narrations suggest that this was shaitan, but as I said, we can't establish this authentically. There's a bit of difference of opinion. This is why